فنعوذ بها وذروا الذين يلحدون في أسمائه سيجزون ما كانوا يعملون The next name, however, are Rauf. And here they're translated as the kind, but I'll translate it as the compassionate. Trans and this name is a beautiful name, Subhanallah. Ar Rauf. Ar Rauf, compassionate, it's very similar to the name Ar Rahman and Rahim. But, and this is a name, by the way, that appears in the Quran ten times. However, uh, this name is mentioned alongside Allah's name in many cases. Uh, the, the name Ar Rahman, Wahor Ra'uf Ar Rahim. But what is the difference between being compassionate and being merciful? The scholars they say that uh, compassion is a softer form of mercy. We say it is, as Al Qurtubi said, Ar Rafatu Ni'matun Mulitha, Min Kulli Wajhin. That Ar Rafa, compassion, it's a, 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 a blessing and a mercy which is mulitha, which is enjoyable from all perspectives. It is enjoyable from all perspectives. So it is not, because sometimes mercy could actually be painful, isn't it? Mercy can sometimes be painful. For example, when your parents discipline you, for you, this is harsh, isn't it? It's harsh treatment. For you, you probably feel pain, but you don't realize it's actually good for you, isn't it? Your parents are bringing you in a good way. They're teaching you what is right and wrong. And sometimes you have to suffer pain to, to, to recognize that. The acts of ibadah are a manifestation of Allah's rahmah, not maybe rafa, salah, zakat, hajj. All of these involve difficulties, isn't it? Praying, waking up for Fajr, staying awake for Isha, fasting, staying away from food, Hajj, Zakat, giving away that which you love. These are difficult things naturally for a person to do. But you attain Allah's Rahmah through these acts of Ibadah. Rafa though, it is something which is completely enjoyable. Everything from all perspectives, you don't see any negativity around it. So for example, when Allah blesses you with knowledge, this is Allah's Rafa. When Allah forgives you, this is Allah's rafa, His compassion. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you uh, delicious food to eat, and clothing, and warmth, and a shelter, this is Allah's rafa. But if you go through a trial and tribulation in life, if you go through a, uh, a trial and tribulation in life, is that Allah's rafa or rahmah? If you go through a hardship, a trial, Allah tests you. Is that Allah's Rahmah or Rafa? Rahmah. That's Rahmah, isn't it? Now here, this is an important point. In our religion, Allah is He, he shows us with, He bestows us with His mercy and His Rafa. And we need to make that distinction between the two. Because if we don't, and we think that Allah's mercy is only Rafa, compassion, then we will look at all the hard things in our religion in a negative way. An example of that, stoning the adulterer. Now we live in a society where when people speak about stoning the adulterer, they think, oh, look at this you know, barbaric treatment of people. This completely goes against their human rights. And you know, the Sultan said even, Allah has prescribed excellence in all matters. So if you kill, kill well, meaning, you know, don't torture, don't mutilate, if you kill, kill well. But when it comes to stoning the adulterer, is this a fast or slow death? It's a slow death, isn't it? The pain the person is going to suffer. But this is where we need to distinguish between Rafa. This is no this is not Rafa. This is not compassion for the person, but this is Rahma. How is it mercy? Look at the example, the beautiful example of Ma'iz ibn, ibn Malik. Ma'iz ibn Malik was a companion who committed zina. 
He came to Rasulullah after committing zina and he said, Tahirni ya Rasulullah, purify me. Purify me. He committed zina and he said, purify me. Now, when you think of stoning, you don't, you know, from the onset, okay, especially from when you're looking from a Westerner's perspective, you don't think of mercy, do you? You don't think of purification. You just think of pain. Because at the end of the day, you only look to um, the, you know, the worldly aspects of things. But Ma'is ibn Malik, he's looking not from the worldly perspective, but he's looking from the Ukrawi perspective, related to the hereafter. So he said, Tahirni. Rasulullah said, Wayhak, woe to you. Irji' wa stagfirillah wa tub ilayhi. Go back to Allah, make tawbah. Because Rasul doesn't like hearing this. You know, he doesn't want to stone a person. He kept on coming back, kept on coming back. And then the Rasulullah said, Is this man crazy? Is this man really crazy? And they said, No, Ya Rasul, he's not crazy. They said, Okay, we'll stone him. And they stoned him and he died. After that, two groups of companions, there were two groups of companions after that. And they viewed him in two different ways. One group of companions, they said, Hada Rajul Hala, this man is destroyed. He's, you know, this man is wasted. Another group of companions, they said, No. This man, he made a tawbah, which was amazing. His repentance was amazing. Rasulullah said, لَقَدْ تَابَ تَوْبَةً لَوْ قُسِّمَتْ بَيْنَ أُمَّةٍ لَوَسِعَتْهُ He made a tawbah. The level of that tawbah was such that if he was distributed amongst a whole nation, he would have covered the, the, the tawbah of a whole nation. So when, when we stone the, the, the adultery, is that act of mercy for them? Because at the end of the day, where would you rather be punished? In this dunya or the hereafter? In this dunya. In this, and that's why he went. Because he realized, I'd rather be punished and purified in this dunya than the hereafter. So even we might think, well, this is, you know, stoning is really harsh. No, this is Allah's rahmah. Not rafa, but rahmah. And this is the problem we have here in the West because we don't associate, when, when we look at these actions, we just look at it from the dunyawi perspective. We don't think about the hereafter. So we don't have an overall picture of the matter. And secondly, in the, when it comes to these matters, we don't just look at it from the individualistic perspective. We look at it from the perspective of a whole society. So when you stone the adultery in an open way, this acts as a deterrent from other people committing the same crime. And so it protects the society. Likewise, this is the law of retaliation. You have in the law of retaliation, meaning if someone murders you, you can have the murderer killed. Allah says, Allah gives you life. There is life in the law of retaliation. How is there life? Because when you kill that murderer, that prevents the murderer from killing again. And secondly, when people see his fate, they're going to think again before they even raise a sword against anybody else. But this society doesn't realize that. They look at everything from the, from the perspective of the individual. The other day, subhanAllah, listen to this story, amazing. One of my wife's uh, friends, uh, someone attempted to burgle her house, but they, they didn't manage to get in. And so they realized, you know, she realized that people tried to enter the house. So she decided to, you know, up her security, she installed alarms, and then she wanted to put like, you know, the uh, spikes on her garden fence to prevent people from jumping over. So she went to the shop and she ordered it, and they said, you know what? If you want to buy this, you need insurance. Insurance? Why do I need insurance? Because if a burglar attempts to climb over your garden fence and he gets hurt in the process, he can sue you. <laughs> can you believe that? He can sue you. And that's what, this is an example where, and there was another story about this in the media, there was a man who burgled the house, but he got locked into the garage. He got locked into the garage. And he couldn't get out. So as a result, he was there for a few weeks. And he was, he was living off dog food. Okay. And the family, when they returned, they found him in the garage. He's like really malnutritioned and he was living off dog food. And they had to compensate for the damages. They had to pay him money. And this was a report in the news. So this is an example where people, they just look at the... The, situation, the individual, the rights of the individual, and they don't look to the rest of the society as a whole. It's all individualism. But in Islam, when we legislate these laws, we have these laws is for the welfare of the entire community. The welfare of the entire community takes precedence over the welfare of a single individual. And that's how you ensure a you know, stable society.
So the last point we were discussing was the difference between Rahma and Rafa and how when Allah is merciful to his slaves, he is merciful in those two ways, either in a way which everyone can appreciate and enjoy that blessing from Allah, or it could be a situation where you go through some hardships and some you know, difficulties in life, but Allah is actually you know, cleansing you uh, through his mercy. So the basic acts of ibadah are like that, where, as I said, when it comes to... And this is a legal responsibility, actually, in Arabic we call it taklif. Legal responsibility, uh, so to pray, to fast, we call it taklif. And taklif is from the word kulfa, which means hardship. Which means hardship. And so, in essence, the basic duties of Islam are, to a certain degree, difficult upon the servant. And that's why you find many you could say non-practicing Muslims, when they look to the Sharia, they view it in this way. Oh, Islam is very strict. Yeah? You have to pray five times a day, you can't go out partying, you can't have girlfriends, you can't do this, you can't do that. It's really, really strict. And that's the only way they're looking you know, at Islamic law. And again, it just reminds me of the way Westerners look at Islamic law. They just look at it from one perspective. They don't see the other aspect of it. But the believer, when he goes and he... He, 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 he goes beyond that level of just uh, viewing the hardship, uh, but that requires really training. <coughs> I mean, one scholar he said, I did ijtihad, I did jihad for 40 years to pray Qiyamul Layl. So, for 20 years of his life, he was striving against his nafs to, to, to do tahajjud. 20 years after that, that's when he enjoyed it. So imagine you're doing, you're, you're waking up in the morning, you're half asleep, you can barely understand what you're reciting. That's jihad. You're doing jihad, you're striving, you're striving, you're striving. And only after 20 years did he begin to, he, he got accustomed to it, he understood what he was reciting, he was spiritually elevated like that, that's when he enjoyed it. And that's, the, that's what we need to aim for in our ibadah. We need to go beyond just looking at the acts of ibadah as a matter of responsibility. You know, Alhamdulillah, I finished praying. You know, that's not the attitude to have. No, I've got it over and done with. It's off my shoulders now. Let's get it over and done with. No. You know, Rasulullah never said to Bilal, for example, Ya Bilal, arihna minas salah. Oh Bilal, make the adhan so that we can get the prayer over and done with. He said, no, arihna bis salah. Give us peace through the, through the prayer itself. It's through the prayer. And that's what we must do. So we should go beyond that, that basic level of viewing the ibadah simply as responsibility. But we should really see it as a, as, as a key to our success, key to spiritual bliss, and a key to happiness.